Today is Wednesday, July 27th, 2011. I'm Matthew TG. I'm Steve Stanley. I'm Heath Mulliken. And I'm Tony Casey. Welcome to the Techology Show, a weekly podcast featuring technology, theology, and everything in between. The world's only user antagonistic podcast. This is episode 117. Woohoo! Yay. Good Yay. morning. All right. Uh, at the top of our show here, we want to welcome David Drury and Steve Deneff with us. David Drury is author of The Faithful Life and co-author of Ageless Faith. He's planted churches in Illinois and Indiana and currently serves as executive pastor at College Wesleyan Church in Marion, Indiana. He is married to Kathy. They've been married for 15 years, have three children, Max, Serena and Lauren. We also want to welcome Steve Deneff. He's senior pastor of College Wesleyan Church in Marion, Indiana. He has more than 35 years of pastoral experience and travels extensively as a conference speaker and leadership trainer. He is the author of More Than Forgiveness, Seven Saving Graces, the way of, and the way of holiness. He's been married to Lori for 30 years and has two children, Nicholas and Ashley. David, Steve, welcome to the show. Good well, to see you. Good to see you as well. Now, um, Steve and David are here to discuss their book, Soul Shift, with us. But before they do that, Matthew, tell our listeners uh, how they can um, get in the chat room and also talk about our giveaway and how listeners can win that. Yeah, all right. Well, we are going to be giving away a copy of Soul Shift. In fact, uh, I think our copy, is that it there on the table that you can hold up? And I can hold it up. For everybody to see. Yeah. There it is. Uh, you can enter this giveaway by doing this. We are uh, letting our recorded listeners enter as well as our live listeners. So if you're listening to this and it's uh, 3 o'clock on Friday afternoon, uh, you still have a chance to win this book. Here's how you'll go about doing that. On Facebook, be sure to like the Techology Show on Facebook. If you do a search for us, uh, we'll come up there. We have a fan page there on Facebook. Like the show and then tag us in a post. So tag about this episode that you listened to, uh, David Drury and Steve Deneff on the Techology Show. Be sure to tag us by putting at and then the Techology Show so that it shows up on our page, and that will enter you to win a copy of Soul Shift, an autographed copy, unless you'd like for us to forge an autograph for you. You can do that. And I don't have a problem doing that. Yes. <laughs> and, and let's really emphasize, big thanks to Wesleyan Publishing House. Yes. They're sponsoring the giveaway today. They are. And so they will actually, you know, th- this is not the actual copy people are oh, going to get. Okay. Joe Jackson is going to send it out right off the press. I mean, ink It'll won't s- even be dry yeah, yet. Yeah. Send it right from WPH and to if you're, our winner. If you're not fortunate enough to win your free copy, we have been told that uh, we don't have a firm date yet, but the Kindle version is on the way. And you can also, I'm sure we'll put a link up where you can go buy a copy and buy lots of copies. Buy one for your friends. Buy one for your family. They make lovely Christmas gifts. <laughs> then I also want to point our listeners towards our chat room because you have the chance today to uh, ask questions uh, via us to yes. uh, Steve and to Dave. So if you hop in the chat room, uh, you can do that either via an IRC client, which you see instructions on the technologyshow.com slash live for doing that, or right there in the uh, next to the show page as you're watching us. Uh, you can get in the chat room there using your Ustream username and password. You have to have an account uh, to, to get in there, but you can create one of those quite easily. So that's how to do that. So there you go, guys. All right. Uh, for those of you that listen to the show regularly, we're not going to have our normal format today. We want to dedicate the whole show to our interview uh, with David and Steve. Uh, let me just say here before we... Uh, jump into our trailer that uh, it's good having everyone back in the studio. Yes. This is like well, the first time in three I know. weeks. Reunited. <laughs> it feels so good. <laughs> People did not tune in to listen to you guys sing. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, big thanks to Matthew. Uh, what, uh, just, you know, he was gone last week, so I had to do what he's doing. And uh, just a deep appreciation. I always feel like I'm flying by the seat of my pants and I'm trying to do it. So, so. do I. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> you, you fly way better than I do. All right. Well, we want to jump into this. Let's go ahead and play the trailer, and then we'll get into the interview. This is not about becoming a nicer person. It's not just about me disciplining myself to be a a more other-centered person. It's allowing the Holy Spirit of God to do that in me.
this God who allows, who is transcendent and allows us to call him daddy, loves me like that. That realization gave me the freedom to begin living as a child. It's not ours. Any money or possessions or whatever it may be, we are to be a manager of them, not an owner of them. There was a very real, um, just a moment before we walked out of that hospital that I am either going to believe God is who he says he is, or I'm, I'm going to walk away. The more we listen for God's voice, the more he gives it to us. I had such a mindset of needing to initiate with God, but God wants me to just sit and receive from him too. Submitting to a shepherd gives you that resource and, and person to lean on and to, to cry on their shoulder and to, uh, and to turn to for guidance. This is what it's all about, reaching out to others, doing for others. Just changing that way of thinking, not just what can I get from them, but what can I give. I've walked with God most of my life. But I look back and I'm like, oh, I was missing out. I didn't really know him. This is what David meant. This is what it means to have your, your soul restored. It allows you to be someone who loves for the sake of and for the purpose of the other person. And I think that's the kind of love that we're, we're asked to have as Christians. All right, guys, maybe the best place for us to start is for you to tell us about the genesis of this book. Well, a few years ago, uh, Tony, we were looking at our congregation, at the way that our congregation was growing, or in some cases not growing. What we found was uh, just a lot of people. No. Ah! <laughs> lot of ways. All right. Well, we dropped you there again, Steve. It's, it's, there's a connection problem on our end, so we're going to ask that question again from the top. Okay? Yeah, just take that question from the top, please. We apologize. Can you guys hear us? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Steve always sees a still shot of yeah. Tony again. Yeah. All right. There we go. There you go. Right. That's us anyway. Yeah, well, we, we see you fine. Let's just take that from the top. Uh, same question. Um, just talk about the genesis of the book. You know, a few years ago, well, we looked at our congregation, and uh, we noticed that there were some people that had come to Christ some years ago, but that maybe had not grown. They were stuck in their spiritual life. And, and uh, I remember probably four years ago, just as a side note in a message that I was preaching, I made the statement that that if we're going to see real disciples come out of the church, we have to change from uh, inputs to outcomes. We have to stop measuring uh, the number of people that are going to Bible studies and following spiritual disciplines and start measuring the actual change in a person's life. Uh, A.W. Tozer said, I don't, I don't want to hear about the books you've read. I desire to see the effect of them. Mm, so yeah. we start saying, well, what would that look like? And then uh, out, of, out of a series of conversations, uh, be, be, we begin to develop kind of a picture of the kind of person that God was trying to create in our lives. You know, but before we, this is kind of in the same vein, before we get into the main body of the book, I'm struck by something in the preface. Uh, you say that research has shown that fewer than one in five of those who call themselves born again have any measurable goals for spiritual growth. I mean, why do you think that is? I mean, for me, it, I think it's quite simple. 
the reason they don't have goals is they don't know where they're going. Mm. When I was a kid, my dad always told me, it's kind of one of those things dads say to sons. He said, if you aim at nothing, yeah. you'll hit it every time. And so the problem is, like Steve was saying about in, inputs and outcomes, we talk so much about what to do in the church, in my spiritual life, in my spiritual disciplines, but we don't talk about where we're going with that. Yeah. And so the reason we don't have goals is we don't know where we're going. And so part of what we're trying to do with Soul Shift is explain and kind of begin with the, the transformed life in mind and describe that in Scripture and in our experience in the church and so forth. And then that helps people know, okay, that's where I'm heading. Now I can actually set goals for how to get there. It has um, Is that because so, for so long in the evangelical church, I know in the South, the goal has been to die and go to heaven. <laughs> I mean, that's been the goal for lots of people. Yeah, it's sort of that ticket to heaven approach. And I, I mean, I think that you can have that view uh, if you don't read the Bible at all. <laughs> <laughs> but there's some pretty clear expectations of growth and of spiritual discipline that would become more like Christ. So even somebody that has a fairly rudimentary sense of what Jesus said knows that there's some sense in which he wants us to change and wants us to act ethically and not just uh, sort of punch that ticket to heaven. I think one of the reasons people don't have goals is because uh, at least those who attend church, when you think about it, what we hear is a lot of behavioral type sermons. Yeah. Uh, what we don't hear is a lot of futuristic language that says, let me paint for you mm. what the life looks like once we're finished. What we hear is a series of sermons about do this, try this, stop that, go here. But what we need is language that says, let's talk about what you could be. Let's talk about potential. Mm -hmm. One of the things that makes somebody change is the idea that they could. Mm -hmm. And I think a great sermon will frame, uh, will frame a person's future in futuristic language. Well, you certainly model that in the book. I think the, the spirit of the book is consistent with what you're trying to uh, uphold or to invite people into. It has a very warm and winsome tone to it, um, you're not saying do this or else. There's not that bludgeoning spirit behind it, but but an invitation to a relationship that can be so much more mm. than what most Christians have experienced. You know, one thing that struck me, uh, it was in the back of my mind the whole time I was reading this book, was, you know, we have this problem at every level of the church. So now I'm going to talk about the Wesleyan Church and governance issues. So... We tell our pastors that their spiritual lives are important, spiritual formation is important, and we pay lip service to that. But when you get to conference, your annual conference, there are basically two things we want to know, and that is, did you pay your budget, and how many did you have in worship? And and one of the things I, I, I hope I'm not – I mean, you tell me, you correct me if I'm wrong. Um, one of the things I see this book trying to do is – to try to get at some measurable spiritual formation issues, which we have been very poor at doing. I mean, am, I, am I getting the right sense of this? You know what? I The whole middle part of what you just said uh, stopped, so I didn't hear all that you said, Tony. Yeah, my point is this, that at the district level with pastors, uh, issues of spiritual formation, we say that they're important, but then at the end of the year, like in the conference report, we want to know two things. Uh, how yeah. many did you have in worship and did you pay your budget? And so while we pay lip service, we don't have anything measurable when it comes to spiritual formation. No, I, I think you're right. I think if, if you look at what we consider, quote, dashboard indicators, which, which are fine, there's really only a few of those. And one of those is uh, the number of people coming to worship. Another one is the number of people, quote, saved. Uh, a third one is the number of people baptized, yeah. and then we want to know uh, the amount of income that's come into the church. What we're not measuring, perhaps, is uh, the number of people that are moving into full-time service mm. for the first time in their life. The okay. number of people that are volunteering, uh, we're not talking about the number of people that have been freed from addictions. Wow. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, or even the, the amount, I'd love to see a statistic uh, on the amount of it integration of cultural integration in our churches if value that yeah um you, you, early on in the book you guys make a distinction between uh reformed and transformed why don't you talk about that a little bit uh transformed it, 
generally it starts with a voice from within. Reformed uh, starts from a voice that comes from without. That's a coach, a parent, a friend, a preacher. Uh, maybe it's the law that says uh, you need to stop what you're doing. But when a person's transformed, there's not always something, quote, wrong with their life. They're just living a normal life, but they hear a voice of God on the inside, not outside, say, uh, do you want more? And and that that voice, they follow that voice, and they'll sometimes make deep, subtle changes that you can't notice on the surface. Mm. Whereas if someone's reformed, we look for immediate changes, and we look for uh, for for a, a fast track. Mm. How do I get there quickly? Wow. Not not the case in transform. We're looking for deep, subtle, hidden changes that affect our lifestyle across the board. Um, I, I think I kind of know the answer to this question, but I mean, I mean, don't don't you think that our culture leans towards the the quick fix? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's a sense in which, I mean, we're fast food, microwave, uh, yeah. we're irritated with the fact that your show has 30, 40 seconds of commercials at the beginning. We're like, oh my goodness, this 40 seconds is eternity. Because <laughs> um, we're training ourselves uh, to be irritated by that. Like, how can I have some kind of a widget to make sure I don't see, you know, a 30 second commercial about a car? Yeah. And and so because of that training we become so uh we become so instant in our way. And and of course Christianity is not instant. We don't just add water and become like Christ overnight. Uh and and so certainly it should take at least 3 days for instance <laughs> within the Wesleyan church and yeah. and the holiness movement larger um um is it is it possible that some of this comes from the fact that we've been a two speed kind of um, group of people, you get saved, you get sanctified, and then you pretty much sit down. Uh, that wasn't the way it was intended to be understood, but it is the pew level understanding, I think, a lot of times. Yeah, and I mean, earlier you talked about, you know, district and Wesleyan type stuff, and, and I'm probably as critical as the next guy about uh, how we lead, but I tell you what, that's in a way just a mirror of our own personal spiritual lives, yes. so I think we need yes. to yeah, we think they might be measuring the wrong thing, but we're measuring the wrong thing in our own spiritual lives so often as well. Uh, I had this experience when I was, I redid a house for my parents when I was at the end of college, and I didn't know what I was doing, and I had to do replacement windows, and I remember getting that measuring tape and measuring what I thought was the right measure oh. of the window, <laughs> and then I got all the windows, there were about 12 windows for this house. I got them. They were super expensive. They were beautiful, but they were enormous. <laughs> they were the wrong size, and they cost a ton of money. And I had to reframe the whole house to fit the window. <laughs> the reason was I was I was measuring the sill instead of the opening, which uh, every that's a every problem. Good man knows that I was. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's the thing. I measured the wrong thing, and that's what we do in our own personal spiritual Very lives. Very good. Uh, Dallas Willard talks about how we we measure the wrong things, and that we. We look at how hard we're trying instead of looking at how easy it's becoming yep. to obey Jesus yep. Christ and what he said. And so what we're trying to do is, and that's why I hope the tone of the book and of this whole soul shift movement is not toward work harder, but towards what could God do so that, as, 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 uh, as Steve says so often, become minded like Christ. Oh, yeah. Now, in the book, you talk about seven specific soul shifts, and we're going to get into that momentarily. But in a general sense, what do you guys mean when you talk about a soul shift? You know, when an earthquake happens, they say that there are tectonic plates deep below the surface of the earth. They're moving all the time. They're moving right now, and you can't feel them. Every once in a while, uh, there will be a sudden shift in those tectonic plates. And when that happens, we call it an earthquake. Uh, and, and that shift in those plates deep below the surface uh, that you cannot see suddenly alters everything on the landscape. Suddenly, whether you believe in those tectonic plates or not, you are affected by them. And everyone around you sees the result of that. We're trying to liken soul shifts to something like that. We think that there's that that the interior of a person is always moving a little bit, but every now and then there will be there will just be a sudden shift in a person's life 
It occurs deep below the surface. Nobody notices, but all of a sudden when that shift is made, it affects everything on the surface. Mm. Whether people around you believe in that stuff or not, mm -hmm. they, they can't deny the evidence that suddenly you have a completely different value system. You've reoriented your life differently. Mm. You react differently. Uh, and so what we've tried to do is to identify what seven of those shifts would be. Uh, well, let's jump into those then. Get, tell us you know, about the seven and you know, describe, describe them briefly to us. Yeah, there's, the first one's meet at you. It's probably the simplest one. It's the one even people who aren't Christians are trying to teach siblings in their own home. Yeah, uh, sure. The idea of orienting yourself and focusing on yourself to others. The second one's called slave to child, and this is a, this is a shift mm -hmm. uh, where our relationship with God changes from just serving God uh, as some king uh, to loving God as a father. Third one is seen to unseen is the sense in which the kingdom of God is right next to this one, right, right about here. <laughs> and just, we are born seeing it. And so it's valuing instead of the temporal uh, material things, the things that are eternal. Yeah. Uh, the next one's uh, called consumer to steward. And uh, all that means is when we came into this world, we were consumers. We like things. We put ourselves in the middle of stuff and say, mine, mine, mine. Something happens when, when God changes our heart and makes us stewards of everything that we own. Mm. Yeah, ask to listen is the next one, the very difficult one. We're prone in our posture to ask others yeah. for advice rather than to listen to God. And in some sense, to even just come to God with questions uh, and, and ask, ask, ask Him for things as opposed to sitting there and listening from the Spirit. Yeah, the next one, the sixth one's called sheep to shepherd. Uh, there comes a time in a person's life when once he has followed Jesus as a sheep, he is called to enlist with Jesus in what God is already doing. So, so stop following and start leading, and that's a, that's a, sh a shift from sheep to shepherd. And, and the seventh one is me to we, and that's the shift from individualism to community, call order. Yeah. It's interesting reading this book. Um, you have work pages on page 140, I think 149 to 153, and when I sat down to read this book, my intention was just read the book, get through it so I can do the interview with you guys. <laughs> and I, I tell you, I got sucked in. And so just just a moment of just being gut level honest, there were two that really jumped out to me personally. And, and I've set some goals. One is seen to unseen. And I, I'm just wondering from your perspective in ministry, in, in our culture today, if this isn't one of the big issues because we are so science-oriented and it's what I see, it's what I hear, it's what I can put under the microscope. And if I can't verify it, um, then, um, th then somehow it doesn't exist. I I'm curious in your guys' experience, um, it it is this just something personal with me and the way I reacted to this or, or is this a, a huge challenge in the culture today? I think uh, for people, especially people who are over 40 years old, um, this is a huge shift. It might even be the biggest, most integral shift because we grew up in a culture that was, as you described, yeah. uh, all empirical senses. Yep. Uh, yeah, but boy, something happens when all of a sudden you, you, you start to read Scripture and you discover, look, Hebrews says we are encompassed. The word literally means standing in the middle of a cloud of witnesses. They're not in the grandstand. They're literally all around us. Uh, Elisha, as the book says, goes outside and looks up and the hills are on fire with the armies of God. And Elisha's servant right next to him never sees that. Mm -hmm. so, so part of it is uh, by, by seen to unseen, we're not saying um, that we have to believe things by faith and then those things happen. We're saying that faith sees the things that are already there. Yeah. Man. Whether we see them or not, we don't create them by believing in them. Wow. They're already there. Faith is the way to see through it. Yeah. Also, um, David, I mean, you when you just talked about ask to listen, now this was the second thing that I just felt like I was nailed in the book. Um, and here again, I, I, I just wonder, I'm going to talk about ministers now. We are always in the position of giving out information, and I just wonder sometimes from our, our very profession as ordained ministers if um, we don't have a hard time just listening. Yeah, I, I mean, I think 
uh, it could be that all of these shifts are particularly hard for men. <laughs> uh, and, well, and to, well, why do you act. say now? Why do you say that, Dave? Why do you uh, say? I, because there's a uh, here, here. Here's the problem, and it's pride. Um, we as ministers in a position, and I think all leaders, get into a place where we try to do these things ourselves. And all of them are a move to more reliance on God, not on self. All yeah. of them. Yeah. And, and you might say that all spiritual growth is, is key to that. Yeah. But, uh, Tony, just so you feel better, Seen to Unseen was my lowest level one, according to my <laughs> assessment. And Asked Listen was the second one on my list. <laughs> That's so, funny. So you and I are a lot alike, yeah. at least where we're at spiritually. And so, but for Asked to Listen, I do think that it's hard for us who are communicators to ask. It's hard yeah. for Steve and I who yeah. are communicators yeah. To listen, we have to train ourselves. Now, that's just listening to flesh and blood people who are right in front of us who may be, in fact, crying. <laughs> and that's yeah. hard to even listen to them, much less to the Spirit of God who we cannot see and is so easy to ignore. Another point on that, both of those, we again, it's back to measurement. We in the church have measured the wrong thing yeah. so long. We have to retrain ourselves to measure spiritual conversations as mm. the priority of our lives. Wow. So we're trying to train our church to do that trying to train ourselves to do that, and that's what we're trying to see happen. Well, Dave, you're right. Misery does love company, so thank you. I'm glad that you scored low on those. <laughs> um, and, yeah, I, yeah, where I really felt nailed in this book was uh, self-sufficiency, mm. that at the end of the day, I'm the guy that needs to pull this off. And mm. felt like by the time I got to the end of the book that that my reliance upon God, that, that he, he, he wasn't my default. I was my default, um, and it's the analogy of the young boy who has this little toy horse, this you know fork horse, and he's carrying it, and and yet he says it's carrying him. And the question fundamentally is this: Are we carrying our faith, or is our faith carrying us? Wow. Um, and I came away just really convicted. There, a lot of times I'm just dragging my faith around, you know. Um, uh, let's let's take a little time out here. I um, just want to once again thank Wesleyan Publishing House for uh, their sponsorship today of giving this book away. I'm going to turn to Matthew at this point. Matthew, once again, just tell our listeners how they can uh, get in on a drawing for this. Yeah, we have a copy of Dave and Steve's book that we want to give to you uh, through Wesleyan Publishing House. So, yes, thank you to them. To enter it for this contest to win this book, what you need to do is get to Facebook, like the Technology Show on Facebook, and then tag us in a post. The way you tag somebody in a post is by typing the at sign and then start typing the name. So after you like us, uh, what you should see is that as you start typing the at symbol and then the Technology Show, it's going to come up as a thing there. You'll choose it, so basically it'll make a link to the show uh, within your post. That's what we want you to do. Those will show up on the page, and then we will take those as your entries. They'll be entered into a random drawing, and someone will be the winner of this book from Wesley Publishing House. All right, and let's also encourage you to check out Wesleyan Publishing House at uh, wesleyan.org backslash WPH. Uh, there are lots of... Um, uh, items there you can choose from. They even have uh, downloadable Sunday school curriculum now, and so uh, check that out. It's on the front page of their website. All right, let's jump back in here. Um, one of the things that struck me in this book is you seem to be drawing attention away from an instantaneous approach to spirituality to focus on a process-oriented spirituality. Um, I, I, I trust that I picked that up. I'm correct there, and, and if I'm correct on that, um, why this shift? Yeah, I it, it, actually it's it's both, Tony. Um, we're not trying to say that that uh, crises don't ever happen in the spiritual life, but not all people grow the same. Uh, uh, the the spiritual growth mm. actually comes in between crises, which makes the next crises possible. Mm. And so, what we're trying to do is is to articulate what that growth trajectory looks like by, by defining where it's headed. And, and some of that, as you've already said, a lot of that is, is really not us, it's God prompting us. But some of that is just knowing where you're going, and then, as you just said, establishing goals and start working towards that means. Yeah, and let me let me add on to that. I think that we're in an interesting context here in College Church that has affected what you're asking. Um, some of your listeners, in fact, may have been down in Jacksonville where uh, where a member of our church 
uh, Chris Bounds, who's a theologian, he actually gave a little speech about different views of spiritual formation and holiness. Mm-hmm. And he actually listed four views, and the fourth view was sort of like, that's not really a view you should have. The other three were, hey, these are a variety of views a lot of us have. All three of those had a footnote, the primary proponent of that. All three of those people are in our church, college church. Mm. Okay. So there's this diversity of views, as you mentioned, <laughs> uh-huh. on how it happens. What soul shift is, is not defining how it happens as much as defining it. And we've had a lack right. of that. We have an uh-huh. obsession right. we have an obsession with how does it happen? You know, we want a how-to right. book right. on Christianity. And that's already been written. It's called the Bible, so (laughs) most of your listeners have a copy. We wanted to instead define how, how, you know, what is that in the future that we're going towards, regardless of, and and here's the reality. There are people that have testimonies of a very instantaneous change. You have people who are, for instance, released from alcohol in a moment, and then you have people that did 12-step process for 10 years. Yeah. But both of them are, uh, you know, you know, hi, I'm Dave, I'm an alcoholic types. It's just God did it a different way, but they both right. wanted to end right. up the same place. Yeah. Freedom. It's yeah. same the conversation in sanctification inside the Wesleyan Church right now must shift from how do I get it to what is possible. Mm-hmm. We, we have to start talking about potential, uh, and, and, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to say, however that comes to you, and in whatever tradition that comes to you, this is not just a Wesleyan book, although I think the Wesleyan Church has a lot to say sure. into this discussion. This is not just a Wesleyan book. This right. is simply saying it doesn't matter where you come from. We believe this is possible in the Christian life. Amen. Um, do you think that maybe in the church we've we've contradicted ourselves because we've we've told people – your unique creation, and God created you with a unique purpose. But then, when it comes to discipleship and transformation, we, we've tried to make it's like cookie cutter Christianity, and we've we've tried to say, well, everybody's got to go through the same process and the same thing, and it's the same for everybody. And I think what your book is saying is, nope, it's it's unique for everybody, but it's just. But it's just part of that process of of having these uh, conversations and and growing together, no matter what that looks like for you. Yeah, you know, uh, here's another really important discovery for us. Uh, That is, the Holy Spirit can be trusted. Uh. He can be trusted to disciple people that he already owns. Uh, I'm, I'm shocked. At, at how much we think we have to give people instructions. Mm. Look, if, if the passion is inside of a person, uh, you don't need always to tell them instructions. You just need to say, if it's there, find a way, and they will find a way. Mm. That's consistent with their temperament. It's consistent with their history, where they come from. It's consistent within their limitations, what they're actually capable of doing. I'm, I'm really an advocate of saying let's define the end for people and then get them started in a few ways, wow. but trust the Holy Spirit. Yeah, very good. You know, one of the things that I liked about the book, I thought it was a breath of fresh air, and um, I, I do like, you know, I hear, you, I hear you loud and clear when you say that that you you certainly are not putting down instantaneous aspects. And so I get that. At the same time, I liked the book because I felt like it did kind to it brought process up to a little bit higher level. And what I think is consistent with life itself and in, in our movement. So let's talk about we're all Wesleyans here. We'll talk about our own movement. And, and that is there in the past, it seems to me that there has been an emphasis more on instantaneous and we've been defined by that. And I think that once you pigeonhole one particular way, you limit yourself and, and those yeah. that, that can't get it in an instant, then they move on somewhere else. Yeah. The, mm. And the way I view that, I think that your inclination is right. We tend towards the the value, raising the value of the process. However, uh, both both views that you're describing, instantaneous or process, can become a little bit of sort of a get-out-of-jail-free get out card for people when they talk about their spiritual lives. 
they can say, well, it's instantaneous. It already happened, so I don't need to be held to any process of growth standard. Mm. Or you could say, well, it's a process, and so don't don't ah. expect to be there yet. And so what we're trying to say, I, I mean, this is Very maybe good. not as this is a little more explicit theological discussion than we've got in this book. But uh, since you're asking, no, go you're ahead, asking, please. You're asking uh, <laughs> the way the way I think it's important for us to view it. There is no there's there's no sense in which you have that get jail, out of jail free card that we all have the expectation for where we end up and again how you get there uh, I'm not sure if any theologian decides that the spirit does which is a little what Heath was saying sure um, so at the end of the day what are your hopes for this book boy mine uh, uh, is that this book will be part of a movement I don't look for this book to start a movement because I think that God already has yes. and I think he wants to but I hope this book will feed a larger movement in the evangelical church to start with that says you know there's been a lot of stuff out there with a struggle theology life is hard and and God, you know God is good but boy my life makes it really hard to be a Christian I hope this book uh, starts to bend that conversation a little bit and say, wait a minute, if we have the Holy Spirit within us, and if, if Jesus Christ is the new humanity, uh, then we, we have higher potential than we thought of. Inside the Wesleyan Church, I hope this book uh, encourages something like uh, what we used to call revival. I really do. I, I hope, uh, I'm I'm praying for more than 200 churches inside our denomination alone to pick up the material and start walking their people through this before General Conference 2012, and here's why. Because I think, as you've already said, I think it would radically change the conversation that we're having. I, I think maybe the measurements would change. I think that delegates would show up at the conference uh, maybe thinking about things a little differently. And I think the agenda would would at least be affected by this. So I would love to see our church as a whole pick this up and uh, and and do this before General Conference of 2012. I have, go ahead. Go on. Well, what what one of the things Pastor Steve says a lot is that the number one job of pastors is spiritual formation. And I, I so for pastors, I think that value becoming embedded. And, and even for somebody like Steve, whose primary job is preaching, and my primary job is an executive pastor, you wouldn't think spiritual formation is my number one job, but it is. Yeah. Mm. Because it's so easy to get distracted yeah, boy. by everything else in running a church. And that's, but that's just pastors. The reality is, for every Christian, I think this is a simple tool that's written at a level that is accessible, and that's what we wanted it to be. Um, that's part of why we did it together, because Steve's kind of brilliant. And, and I'm kind of fourth grade level. And so by getting it a little bit accessible to people, we wanted to make sure uh, that they could take the next step. Uh, you mentioned to pick up the resources along with this book. Is there anything else aside from the book itself that uh, a church could have or would use for resources? Are there any other materials that uh, coincide with this? Or is it, oh boy. Oh. <laughs> uh... Do we, do we lose them? I think so. Oh, darn it. Watch your language. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, the dog is gone. Remember, Casey, this is a trial of your face. You're offline. Yes. yes. Mr. Chairman. You know, I think NPH is doing I can't this. tell you my fears last week that this was going to happen. Yeah, you talked to me about it. Yeah. And then we made it through last, year, last week with nothing. This is what you call the summertime pattern. Well, what are we going to do? That's what you call it. Really I think we ought to go to the. That, uh, I think we ought to go to the uh, library every week. Oh, hey guys, wow. okay. <laughs> Just a minute here. Hold on with us now. We gotta. We are reconnecting to the servers. Yeah. Just hold on. Hang those Nazarenes. We'll they, start. <laughs> TG <laughs> will start attacking. with your question. Okay. <laughs> okay. So you'll just re-ask it. NPH strikes again. I just love all the shop talk. That's great. <laughs> well, I tell you, we apologize, guys. I, we usually don't have this these kind of issues. No, this is the first time. Okay, so we are back on. Prayer wasn't good enough. We are back on the air. 
So my question was, is there anything aside from the book that a church would use for materials? I know sometimes when an author, uh, when authors come out with a book, they have supplemental materials for small groups, say, or Sunday school classes or whatever it may be. Or are we, if we as a church, say my church, Golden Grove, were to go through this book, would we just use the book itself as the piloting for the uh, discussion? Yeah, I, I mean, that's a good question. And I think a lot of books try to give you some materials. This one, it's it's extensive. And for that reason, there's a couple answers to the question. One is there's a lot of free resources that will become available as early as October, all online at oursoulshift.com. Again, oursoulshift.com good. or at collegewest.com slash soulshift. And so, and those those are actually in a lot of communication pieces out there, or on Facebook, you can get all that stuff. So a lot Good. of free resources Good. available. But then also on top of that, are uh, there in November releases a whole DVD ROM kit that wow. has a resources on it. it. It also includes a lot of the video work that was done. That includes portions of Steve's sermons, interviews with Good. dozens of people in our church, and how God's transformed their lives. And then a lot of resources that are easy to print off, and so on and so forth. I mean, and there's all sorts of uh, assess, uh, all sorts of stuff related to that. Online is the pathway to get some of the stuff that isn't even in the kit, such as getting an assessment of your church. We did an assessment of our whole church that was done by Dr. Tim Steenberg. That's a really well done thing. It's really kind of like Reveal at Willow Creek, but mm-hmm. on steroids. It's a little bit more intense and a little bit more involved. And of course, it had, and it, yeah, and so you can do it quick. And then also uh, that there's daily devotionals that people can get to their email inbox related to Great. Social. Well, guys, I can't I uh, can't applaud you enough for oh, doing that and for having those uh, extra things like that because that's that's just huge. Yeah, and you know, pastors can pick and choose, or leaders in yeah. the church. You know, we didn't even use everything that we provided. You know, some of the stuff we did, and other people may find this or that thing not useful and so forth. Part of what this is is college churches, uh, not just emphasis, but commitment on taking what God has given us as, as a church and making that available to other people. And, and we're, we're trying to do it free or at least as cheap as we can. Uh, so uh, while we're happy to do it, we really feel at College Church that we're, that we're doing what God has called us and equipped us to yeah. do. Yeah, that is so commendable. Yes. Um, talk to us a little bit about uh, events that are taking place in October. There's a series of uh, one-day events, uh, various sites around the country, actually all the way from Pennsylvania. I think we're doing one in the Carolinas, a uh, couple out in uh, California. Uh, I think eight different sites where we'll be with the district leaders in the Wesleyan Church and outside of it. Um, and we'll spend a day talking about spiritual formation, just overall, uh, how do we move our congregation forward? How do we make spiritual formation the most important thing that pastors, all pastors, Mm -hmm. do? And then specifically, we'll talk towards the uh, second half of the day about how uh, Soul Shift fits into that grid. Yeah, the idea behind that is really that the events are a gift. Uh, We're bringing along a worship band with us led by Emily Vermilia. And and we hope that it feels a little more like a retreat than a seminar. So it's a good thing for pastors and key leaders to go to. So we're excited about it. It starts actually at our church on October 4th, and then it ends up in the Pacific Northwest on October 20th. I don't know whether Dave mentioned this or not, but uh, Emily, who's our worship arts director, actually we flew her out to Colorado, and she actually uh, wrote and then uh, went into the studio and performed and cut seven songs, uh, one for each of the ships. Uh, huh. I mean, I, these are these are really good songs. They're it's thoughtful songs. Church, yeah. yeah, and we've learned them. And so, you know, churches that go through this can actually uh, uh, encourage uh, this whole movement yeah. with their music program as well. Now, are these events going to be held at churches, uh, these different locations, or? They're all, all of them uh, currently are at churches that can house that kind of event. All right. All right, well, we're going to go ahead and wrap this up. Um, Once again, just uh, remind us of the website where we can um, just take advantage of materials that are going to be offered through this. Yeah, it's OurSoulShift.com, and that's also where people can register for these events coming up in October. Uh, And then, or you could go to CollegeWest.com slash SoulShift and find some information there as well. So, you know, it's a great way to get involved with this. 
also the, the Facebook page has quite a bit of activity uh, to be able to know what people are saying and hear from real people and sort of say, what do you think about this? A lot of our people in our church have even interacted there, so they this is old hat to them. All right. Well, Dave, Steve, we want to thank you so much for taking time out to be with Absolutely. us and also putting up with the nonsense of our connection today. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, we apo- discouraging. <laughs> yeah, we apologize for that. Uh, we'll clean it up in post-production. But again, thanks, guys. We appreciate you taking time out to be with us. Mar- thanks for the opportunity. It's been great to be with you. God bless you guys and what you're doing. All right. Yeah, I remind everyone again just about our giveaway. We have now five people that have successfully completed the tasks required to uh, be entered for the giveaway. You can <laughs> enter to win a copy of Soul Shift by liking our Facebook page and then tagging us in a post. And uh, it will be sent, this copy of Soul Shift will be sent directly to you from Wesley Publishing House. And uh, good luck to everybody as you enter. Coming up in the future, August the 3rd, we have Dr. Bob Weitzel. He'll be with us to discuss his book, Waypoints. And then August the 10th, Matthew Duprez will be here. Uh, the main topic of discussion is intergenerational ministries. Uh, we're beginning to see the importance of bringing generations together. One of the um, things that's happened over the last couple decades in the church is we've kind of segmented age groups, and, and we're beginning to see just through research. Uh, we had Dr. Melinda Denton here uh, a few months ago, and, of course, one of the things that she talked about, their research is showing that uh, we need to do more with intergenerational faith, and so Matthew DePrez is going to talk about how that's unfolding at their church. August 31st, uh, going to be a special edition of our show. We have Dr. Bob Cranston and uh, Paige Cunningham um, Bob Cranston is a uh, medical doctor. Uh, He's also uh, in the Free Methodist Church. Uh, Paige Cunningham is the director of the Center for Bioethics, and we're going to be discussing Bob Cranston's book, Bioethics and Today's Christian, Finding Your Way Through the Morass of Today's Overwhelming Medical Ethical Dilemmas. Uh, Bob has actually uh, made a 12- to 14-week discipleship, uh, adult, uh, Sunday school, however you want to view this, uh, literature that you can walk through with um, individuals. And what I love about this is they they bring to our attention issues that are not on our radar screen but ought to be. Right. Um, And Paige Cunningham, uh, she has often talked about how with the whole issue of abortion, that uh, that would get on uh, our radar screen way too late. And her concern is that there are a lot of things now that we're just not paying attention to and that the church needs to mm-hmm. perk up and, um, you know, and, and, and get, uh, get on, on their um, agenda. All right. Um, Heath, going to turn to you. Where can our listeners find you online? They can find me at ChaserLine.com, and from there uh, can find me on Twitter and Facebook and all that good stuff. And, uh, yep. Yeah. All right, Steve. Facebook.com, Steve.Stanley. Brother TG. You can find me at MatthewTG.com, where if you can spell my name, you are worthy to view the way <laughs> you win the prize. <laughs> all right, and you can find me at Facebook.com backslash AKC64. As always, we want to encourage you to send emails. You can do that at the Technology Show at gmail.com, or even better, you can call and leave us a voicemail. Just dial 3049 Theology. That's 304 986 5649. Leave us a message, and we may even play your comments on the air. As always, we want to thank those who are in the chat room, our live listeners, especially for what you put up with today with our connection. We apologize for that. That is out of our control, though. Um, And uh, thanks so much for hanging with us. And for those of you that are listening via the podcast, we appreciate your continued support. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Adios. No. (laughs) 